Thanks, Andrew, and welcome everyone to BigML's Winter 2015 webinar. The team here at BigML is constantly bringing new features and algorithms to the platform, and these webinars are a way for us to pause and summarize all that we've been working on. So there's quite a bit to cover today, so let's jump right in. All right, so even though the only requirement to register an account with BigML is an email address, we are determined to make getting started with machine learning as easy as possible. To that end, we have integrated Google Authentication alongside our existing Amazon and GitHub integrations. If you already have an account with one of these providers, then accessing BigML is easier than ever. To our existing storage browsers for the Azure Marketplace and Dropbox, we have also added support for Google Drive and Google Cloud, making it super easy to load data already stored in the cloud into BigML for analysis. Connecting your cloud storage only takes a few clicks. Another new feature, which I'm going to show you guys in a second here, is projects. So the idea for projects is that they make it easy to organize machine learning resources in BigML, through the both, you, both through the user interface and the API. In order to create a project, all that is needed is a project name, although tags in a description can be added as well. And those will be inherited by all the derived resources. So once a project has been created, New sources can be assigned to that project, and anything you make from that source will automatically be assigned to the project as well. So in the user interface, the project selector can be used to filter the view of available resources. And finally, a, as an additional benefit, is that when you delete a project, it bulk deletes all the resources assigned to it as well. So that, that's a few things we'll check. So you can see right here on the login, we can actually log in with Amazon, GitHub, or now Google as well. And I've already authenticated, but normally it would pop up a little window. You have to grant permissions, uh, and then you're, you're right into your account. So it's super easy. Up from the source view, there's several ways that you can now browse data from cloud storages and bring them in. Obviously, the new one here being Google Drive. And this hasn't been configured yet, so I can actually just go into Allow. And it creates the access token. And now if I go back here... It should launch a browser where I can actually see the contents of my Google Drive. I can choose a file, and I can upload it into my Sources tab. Similarly for the Google Storage. So the projects live up at the top here. And again, they work sort of like a filter for all the objects that you'll create. So I could create a new project, which I could call... Google Drive or something. And you'll notice now that the sources that we're showing before have disappeared, and that's just because they're now for filtered um, here, for example. They're back here, and I can change this back to Google Drive. And now anything I add from here, if I come in, let's see, go into the webinars, 2015, and pull in this data set. Uh, we can create a data set from that source, and you'll notice that the projects just stay affiliated. So all these resources, any, any data sets or models or anomaly detectors, anything I build from that source will all automatically be included in this now Google Drive project. So this is a very handy way, you know, when you're starting a new project, whether it be for a specific customer or a specific, you know, data that you're playing with, it's, it's a very nice way to organize that. And then, of course... We can delete this project. All right. So in the last webinar, we gave a preview of the dynamic scatter plots, which we designed originally as a tool to visualize the anomaly detector. So with today's re release, the dynamic scatter plots have found their way into the lab section of our UI and have evolved into a general purpose data set visualization tool. So the dynamic scatter plot leverages our new in-memory sample server, which also can compute correlation statistics. We'll see more about the sample server later, but let's take a quick look at the capabilities of the dynamic scatter plot. And to do this, I'm actually going to use a data set from UCI that uh, 
is data about vehicles and the engine size and fuel economy. So if we come back in here, I'm going to switch accounts to do this. All right. Upload this source. I'll show you what the, some of the features in here look like. So now all I did was upload the source and just do a one-click data set. You know, so we have our traditional summary statistics that we're, we show in the data set view. And so we can see, for example, that we have a histogram of miles per gallon. Uh, there's the number of cylinders in each engine type, ranging from three up to eight. There's the displacement, horsepower, etc. And what we could do is we can go over to the labs, which is linked at the top here, and we can go into this new into the scatter plot here, and we can now type in the name of this data set. And it's worth mentioning in this interface that the dev mode, there's a slider there, so if you're working in dev mode, you can switch there and it'll pull the data sets from that environment instead. And so what we get with this dynamic scatter plot is basically the you know it's it's a bit like a three dimensional plot so we can we can choose one one variable on the x coordinate one on the y coordinate and then we can color the the plot the point the plotted points by a third dimension if you will so we could try to look for something that we expect to be correlated for example we could look at uh, displacement and we could plot that against horsepower we expect those to be correlated uh, and we can see right away that we've got a pretty strong correlation there. Uh, larger displacement tends to have larger horsepower. And in fact, we actually return a few um, correlation statistics down here. So you can see, for example, the measurement for these two variables, X and Y, that we've chosen. We can see the Pearson and the Spearman measurements. So as those tend towards one, that indicates that those variables are in fact correlated. So those, those are fairly well coordinated. And we can, this is colored by the car name right now, which is less informative than, say, if we color by miles per gallon. All right, so let's play with this interface a little bit. What does the bright green versus red mean? Now, if we take a look at this little ball here, we can freeze the display with the shift key, and now we can, what we see is that there's three data points in there, and we can actually scroll through them, one, two, three, on the selector there. And for each data point, we're showing you the histogram of all the data points in this sample. So for horsepower, this is how the horsepower is distributed across all the cars in this data set. And the particular instance that we're looking at in the inspector is highlighted in that little yellow bar. Right, so we can see how that's varying across here. And if we look down here for the miles per gallon, we can also see this is the data for this particular point that we're inspecting. So this number one of three has a horsepower of 225, a displacement of 455, and a miles per gallon of 14. So we kind of see the bright green are the lower miles per gallon, whereas the whoa, sorry, whereas the ones that are red are the high, higher miles per gallon. So, for example, this red dot down here, we're looking at miles per gallon of 44, so it's quite a bit higher. And it's you know it sort of matches our perhaps our intuition that the higher displacement engines have higher horsepower and lower fuel economy. Now, of course, there are a few interesting anomalies that uh, kind of stand out, like there's two dots right here, one green and one somewhat red right next to it. Uh, we can actually see these are two engines that have a very similar displacement and very similar horsepower, So, but one has a miles per gallon, the green dot there, of 16, and the one right next to it is 32. So that that's potentially interesting. But you know what, what we're getting with this dynamic scatter plot, we just took that data set, and this is a way to really explore the data in a much more fine-grained way. Uh, in a fine-grained way and see what the patterns are in the data. And this is a relatively small data set, but this actually will work with large data sets as well. Uh, and again, this comes back to our sample server, basically being able to take slices of the entire data set, which is potentially very large, and display it. Uh, and then if this was a larger data set, we could actually uh, dynamically resample this data set and see how the plot changes. So another th interesting thing is to look at the model year. Oh, not, the, not for the color, sorry, but on the X coordinate. So we can actually look and see how fuel economy is, was changing over the year the, of the car manufacturer. 
Uh, and so one thing you can see just right away from the way the, this, the each one of these bars is sort of reducing over time is that the horsepower of these engines over model years is decreasing. Right? So the engines that were being manufactured were being manufactured with less and less horsepower. Uh, but you can also you can also tell straight away from this visualization that the fuel economy over the entire fleet was by and large increasing as well, right? So we have almost no red in this first bar chart from 70, uh, but by the time we get down to 82, there's a, a significant amount of red, which again remember is the higher fuel economy. So we can see hovering over here, this is 44. Now, I didn't mention, but the other thing you can do is you can actually zoom in on this as well, right? So these are all kind of close together. I can actually drag a boundary around these points. And again, for a larger data set, you can imagine that that first view we're looking at was just a sample. And as I draw that boundary, it is actually creating a filter on the in that area and resampling over the data set to generate this plot again. And of course, we can keep zooming in if we want to see what separates these two data points, and if we click anywhere in the field, it'll return to the full view. All right. So another new feature is the availability of the output to a data set for all batch operations. So batch prediction, batch centroid, and batch anomaly score can all output to a data set. So this ability combined with the dynamic scatter plots, makes it possible to visualize and explore in greater detail the output of modeling, clustering, and anomaly detection tasks. So we've already seen just taking a data set, we can go straight into the dynamic scatter plot and we can visualize you know, correlations and look for patterns in the data. But we could, for example, take a data set, train a model, compute a batch prediction, and the output of the batch prediction we can use to actually create a new data set. And now we could perhaps visualize confidence or expected error. Uh, we could even use flatline to create you know, a, a new feature that shows us how the predicted value differed from the known value in the model. And we could actually plot you know, what, what areas you know, versus various coordinates where the model is performing well or performing poorly. Similarly, for clusters, we could do a batch centroid and output that as a data set. And now we can actually visualize clusters as well. So we can see in various two dimensions which uh, features are clumping our data together. And then, of course, for the anomaly detector, we can do a batch anomaly score as an output into a data set. And now we can visualize anomalies as well. So I'm going to show you an example of visualizing clusters when we introduce uh, G-means, which is our new clustering algorithm. So right now, let's just take a, uh, a look at an example of visualizing anomalies. So I'm going to use this Pima Indians diabetes data set from the UCI repository. So we'll come back to the dashboard. Bring this data set up. And if you haven't seen this data set before, you know, we've got these features that are various diagnostic measurements that are very easy to perform, perhaps, so like number of pregnancies, a four-hour plasma glucose, uh, tricep skin thickness, et cetera. And then we have a final determination of whether or not that patient did or did not have diabetes. And so as a classification problem, right, you would build a model that tries to use these input parameters to predict whether or not a patient has diabetes. So instead, what we're going to do is take this data set and build an anomaly detector. So I'll go ahead and just do a one-click anomaly. And <clears throat> remember, what we're going to do on the batch output is I'm going to add the anomaly score as a new column. So we'll be able to still see, you know, if we wanted to explore uh, based on the label or on the anomaly score, we can still we can still, do, still do that. It's no problem. So now that we have the anomaly score, we need to assign for every instance over the original data set, we want to compute the anomaly score for that data. So to do that, we do the batch anomaly score. use the same data set that we train the anomaly detector with. And we can configure the output, but having this be scores all right. What we need to do is select this option here. This will allow us to have the output of the batch anomaly score be a new data set. Uh, 
And now we have a button down here that's output data set. And now we can see all the original features that we had, plus a new feature down here, which is, the, again, the actual anomaly score. So let's go back into the labs. And we can pull this data set up with the batch anomaly score. Right. And let's go ahead and take a look at, let's see, look at the diabetes pedigree. This is sort of a measurement of, you know, how much diabetes there are, is in the family history of the patient. Uh, and we could also chart this against plasma glucose, and we could actually start by just looking at the class. So again, this was the true-false for diabetes. And so we can see looking at the data inspector that the, there we go, the light blue is the true and the dark blues are the false. And so just visually, you can tell that, you know, there's sort of this nice big clump of the dark blues, which are all the false that are in the region of space where people have a low family history and a low four-hour plasma glucose, which uh, seems to make a little bit of sense. We've got a few kind of outliers out here, which are you know, very, very high family history and also very high plasma glucose. Uh, and in fact, these two data points have an opposite outcome, right? So here we have one that is false. And right next to it, we have one that is true, even though they're both sort of at the extreme end of that. And we can actually now change the coloration to the anomaly score and see how they how they match in terms of being anomalies. And so now the bright green all have low anomaly scores. And again, remember for our anomaly detector, any number tending towards zero means that the point is very much like the other points in the data set. Therefore, it's normal. Whereas anything tending towards a one is more anomalous. And so we can see that these two data points are in fact being labeled quite handily as anomalies. And of course, we have a few that are distributed around in here as well. We could, again, zoom in on these, explore a little bit. And we get these cases where there's two data points right next to each other. And again, this is, you know, for the anomaly score, remember that this is kind of one of those things where just because it has, it has a high anomaly score doesn't mean that the data point is bad. You know, there's sort of a connotation problem there. It just means that it's unlike the other data points, right? So here we have two data points that are quite similar, uh, but one, you'll notice, has more pregnancies than the other. And then the other thing that's interesting is that the other one has a blood pressure of zero. All right, that seems a little strange. So what we'll do is we'll come back out here, and maybe we'll explore blood pressure. That's what I meant, not BMI. Uh, and if we do that, if we plot this blood pressure by plasma glucose, now we see that this whole family of points here that are all arranged on the blood pressure of zero, which is kind of strange. Uh, you hope your patients have higher blood pressure than zero. Now, of course, it's possible that in the original data set, uh, the, the zero just meant that it wasn't collected. Uh, and so we'd really rather treat that as a missing value. So that's something we could now, having now discovered that in the dynamic scatter plot, we could actually go back to this data set and we could correct that. So we could we could mark everything as a blood pressure of zero as being a missing value. Or if we just wanted to ignore those points, we could actually draw a boundary around this. And we could actually click that button there to create a new data set just from that boundary that we drew. So we've now removed all of the, um, the instances that had a blood pressure of zero, for example. Okay. So let's talk about our new clustering algorithm, which is called G means, uh, the G standing for Gaussian. And in order to introduce the concept of G means, let me review just clustering basics, right? So as people, if I give you this little two-dimensional plot and said, group this into three things, we'd probably get a pretty consistent be you know behavior across humans that would look something like this. And when we talk about k-means or even the g-means clustering, this is sort of what we want the computer to do as well. We sort of want it to draw these nice you know, boundaries around data points and group them together. Uh, and in the case of k-means, we're always telling it how many ahead of time. So we give it a data set like this. We say, okay, k equals 3, 
do your best, and it's basically trying to find these centroids that clump the data nicely into three distinct groups. Now, of course, the drawback to the KA beans is that you need to know ahead of time how many groups you want to know. Sometimes that's okay, like if you're doing you know, some kind of customer segmentation where you want your customers in four groups or you know, something where you know ahead of time how many groups you want, that, then it's perfectly reasonable to specify K. Uh, but there are other times where you're just exploring and you would sort of prefer to just have the optimal K. Well, what does optimal mean? Well, G means is one of the ways in which you can sort of discover an optimal K for a specific you know, situation. So let's do this again, but this time we'll look at this uh, sort of little scatter plot. And the way G means works is it actually starts from K equals 1. But just to save a little time on the slides, we'll start from k equals 2. All right, so we'll just assume one step of the algorithm is already gone. And we're going to give our g-means algorithm this data set and say, okay, k equals 2. So it's going to try to group things into two data sets, uh, two groups. And so you'll probably get something that looks roughly like that. Now what the g-means algorithm is going to do next is sort of look at the distribution of the points in each one of these groups. And if they're Gaussian enough, it's going to keep them. All right, so the first one, that looks pretty good. You know, it's a nice sort of Gaussian looking distribution, but that second one looks not so great. All right, so what the algorithm will do now is they'll say, well, we're going to keep one and we're going to split one. All right, so if we keep one and split one, then our new k will be three. So we'll start over. We'll set k equals three and run k means again. Maybe this time we get something that looks like this. And so the first one looks okay and the next two are still both sort of bimodal there, so we don't like those. So this time we'll keep one and we'll split the other two, so our new k will be 5. We'll let it run again, and now we get something like this. All five look nice and smooth, and so k equals 5. And so this is a nice hierarchical way of combining k-means with this sort of Gaussian measure to automatically determine uh, sort of the optimal value of k. So let's go ahead and run an example of this. <coughs> And for this, I'm actually going to use just kind of this synthetic data set. And the way this works is that in, if you do a one-click cluster, we're actually going to do g-means by default. Um, if, you, if you actually come into this configure cluster panel, then you'll see here you can actually choose the algorithm. So k-means is where you get to specify the number of k. Uh, whereas if we switch this to g-means, then we don't specify k anymore, but this idea of critical value. And it is worth describing what the impact of the critical value does. This essentially controls how picky the g-means is going to be about the distributions needing to be Gaussian, right? So if we give a higher critical value, then it's going to be a lot less picky, uh, and you'll tend to get fewer groups. Whereas if you set this number smaller, then it's going to be quite a bit more constrained. You're looking for very Gaussian distributions, and you'll tend to get uh, more clusters. We'll go ahead and leave this at the default. Everything else between the two algorithms is the same, right? Whether or not you enable the model clusters feature, which we've talked about in previous webinars, how you want to handle default numeric values, etc. Everything else stays the same. So let's go ahead and let this run. And we're going to do, with this one, I'll actually go ahead and uh, once we've clustered it, we're going to do the, the batch centroids. So we, we can see that k came up as 5, which if you were looking at the name, you probably already knew, right? So cluster's 5, but that's okay. It's, it's meant to be an example that works very, very nicely, so it'll be convincing. Um, but what, we, what we'd like to do now is we'd like to sort of take this and plot it in the histogram, in the dynamic scatter plot, and, you know, see if we can see these clusters visually in a way that makes sense. You know, see if, it, if the algorithm is doing something useful when it discovers this k equals 5. And so what we can do is we can actually take this new cluster that we've designed, or that we've created, and we can do a batch centroid. What, this, what we can do now is put in the data set we trained on, and this is going to go through for every instance and assign the centroid label. So we're going to get a new data set, if I check here, where we have all the original data plus the group in this cluster that each data point is assigned to. We can output this as a data set. And now we can come back into the scatter plot. Now we can pull up this data set and explore it. Great. 
So we'll color it by cluster, that's what we'd like to do, and we could start by plotting, for example, field one versus field two. Uh, so we can see you know, that the algorithm has done a pretty fair job in these two particular dimensions of isolating this nice green separation. And we got some interesting stuff happening here with the, the blue and sort of the salmon color here where they're, they're quite overlapped. But of course they're just overlapped, or potentially just overlapped in this dimension. So we can try field one versus field three. Now we can see the blue and the salmon are separated very nicely. Uh, and similarly, field one, field four. Now this orange and light blue. And then field one, field five is where we get a nice, nice separation between all of these groups in those two particular dimensions. And just for comparison, you know, this would be the original statement of the problem if I just essentially remove the coloration by setting it equal to field five, right? So now we're plotting field one in the X, or sorry, field one in the Y and field five in the X. So the color is just moving from left to right. So this would be, if I you know, just gave you this data set and said, make this into an optimum number of groups. And that's essentially what the k-means algorithm just did for us when we apply this label. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the sample server because uh, this is actually a pretty neat feature that's hiding underneath the dynamic scatter plot. So previously, when you want to explore raw data using BigML, there are really only two options. The summary statistics provided by the data set view, or you can download the data as CSV and explore it again that way. So there are plenty of situations where a quick sample of the data is sufficient for analysis. For example, the dynamic scatter plot that we've been demoing uh, makes use of samples to allow quick visualization of data without having to render every single data point. Now, the, the, we're not just using the sample server internally. We've actually exposed this service through our API, making it possible to, do, uh, to create fast access to the raw data of a data set in an on-demand basis. So how does it work? Well, a new sample is created with a post which contains the data set ID from which the samples will be generated. This starts an asynchronous process, like most tasks in BigML, which loads the data set into an in-memory cache in a special format. Once the data set is loaded, Multiple and different samples of the data can then be extracted using parametrized requests and specifying the sample size or various query string filters. So you know, once you get, um, once the data set is actually loaded into memory, then you can actually make repeated samples of that in-memory format. And that's what that dynamic scatter plot is doing. So the first, when we load the data set, we're just doing, you know, creating that in-memory version. And then every time we drag a boundary over in the dynamic scatter plot, that's creating a filter. Right, for various range of two variables. Uh, and every time we do the X and Y, then we're essentially filtering by the, the variables we want to see. Now, if you don't issue a get against the sample uh, within the, the time to live, then the sample will actually expire. So this works a bit like a cache. And uh, a, you know, few, uh, subsequent gets will return, it will still return a 200, but you'll get a status faulty, which would allow you in an application like the dynamic scatterplot, for example, to reissue the uh, sample creation. <clears throat> All right, so when requesting a sample, the server can actually do a linear regression. And as we've already seen in the dynamic scatter plot, it can also compute Pearson's and Spearman correlations for either one numeric field against all other numeric fields or between two specific numeric fields. And so this is just an example of some of the ways that you can do filtering with a sample server. You know, for example, we can filter by fields. So we can, when we're creating a sample, we can specify which fields we want. Um, the I prefix allows you to select fields based on a case insensitive uh, field name, if you will. Uh, you can also set a limit. And for the actual rows of data that come back, you can set boundaries. So you can filter by rows, so it's the first example there we'd be just looking for feature zero having a value of two. You can, of course, negate these, so feature zero not having a value of two. Uh, you can also specify ranges, right? So feature zero being between minus 10 and 10, for example. <clears throat> uh, 
So the sample server is currently only available through the API, but like everything else in our API, it's uh, a REST API, and we have the documentation online. So right here in the header, there's a link for developers, and there's the actual documentation, and you can come through and see the documentation for the sample server and all of the different ways you can filter. I've only just given a very small example of what's possible. So one of the distinguishing features of BigML is our fully featured REST API, which makes it possible to create applications that lever leverage powerful machine learning algorithms in the cloud. Another distinguishing feature is the consumability of our models, clusters, and anomaly uh, detectors that make things like local predictions easy and fast. So a perfect example of what is possible is our new BigML X application. This is a native OS X desktop application which outsources the complex machine learning through our API into the cloud, uh, but is then capable of making local predictions offline. Let's take a quick peek at this. So this is actually the application here. Log in. There it goes. All right, and what we're seeing here is that we've got these two sort of predefined workflows. Notice also that we have access to the projects that we've defined, uh, but we can do a model workflow, okay, which will take a source, create a data set, do a predictive model, doing basically a one-click model, and then it's going to bring up a form where we can do predictions, and we can do the same thing for cluster, source data set uh, to a cluster and then to centroids. So let's go ahead and run this with a, a data set. So we've got this uh, the country that the various grapes are from. This is a, like a wine sales data. Um, we've got a rating, whether or not the wine was from Oregon, what the actual price was, and then a total sales. The idea being that you could take this, this data set, or you could take this source and create a model that would predict for a new wine what your total sales might be. All right, so we can just take this TSV file and we can actually just drag and drop it onto this application and it's automatically going to create a source, the data set, and the tree, and then bring up a little uh, prediction form where we can now make predictions. So I can experiment with changing the price and you can see the total sales changing in real time. Uh, I can also control missing variables, right, so I can take out the rating. I can remove this field from the prediction as well. And again, this, these predictions are now being done locally. So another example of how consumable the BigML models and actually the clusters and anomaly detectors are as well is the new Google Apps script for predictions and and centroid computations, um, which you can now, using this uh, Google Apps Script, you can make predictions directly in a Google Docs spreadsheet. So we're going to take a look at an example using the same wine data set since we've already created it. So you can imagine that I've got this Google Doc where I just have my data, there's previous data, and now I've got some new wines that I'd like to make a prediction for. I can actually come in here and start the script. And this time I need my API key, so actually that's not hard to do, it's right here. Everything in the dashboard you can access, you can see the URL to access that object uh, through our API directly just using that little gear icon, and so included in that is the API key. So we'll come back over here. I have no models in production mode. All 
Oh, did I do it in development mode? No, oh, I did it in development mode. <laughs> okay. All right, so development mode. All right. So basically what I'm doing there is I'm just telling the you know, the, the app script which model I want to use to make predictions, uh, giving it the credentials so it can access those models through the API. Now I can actually highlight these fields and when I execute the script, it's going to use these as input to generate the predictions. So we can come in uh, and hit predict. And it should run these instances and compute the predicted total sales and also return the error for each one. And so again, this is, you know, this is an example of how easy it is to, to not just do the machine learning with BigML, but to also create applications that integrate with BigML, either to, uh, in the case of the BigML X application, to be able to actually drive the machine learning process where it uploads the source and does the entire workflow, um, or in the case of the, the script here, being able to actually consume those models back out of BigML and make predictions in something like a online spreadsheet. So both of those, the BigML X and the Google App Script, are uh, not approved yet. So they're they're still only available for beta access. So if you're interested, just let us know. You can just shoot us an email, uh, and we'll be happy to have have you as a tester. All right. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Andrew to moderate any questions, and then of course, as always, don't hesitate to ask us questions through email our online campfire as well. We monitor them 24-7 and are always happy to help out.